All right, using quotes. There are a few reasons to use quotes, and one of the, we're going to go through what I consider sort of the top four, and they are um, that they add credibility when you're quoting an authority, they add interest, they're useful with commentary, and they're useful for adding support for your paper. That last one is the one that you're probably most familiar with when you're using support, right? And, and so that's the one I'll spend the least amount of time on because I think you're really familiar with it. Okay, now with credibility, this is the kind of thing that you can do when you are saying something yourself, but you want to have some added oomph, right, by using um, some kind of famous person. Okay, so why would Bill Gates maybe have some special authority that we could con con consider this quote more, more valuable? He's like really well known, especially for like you know, the richest man. Yeah. Right, not only one of the richest men, but he sort of has a reputation for being a nerd. He's not one of the, you know, more cool type tech guys. And so the fact that he would presumably know something about making a lot of money and also about um, being a nerd and having people work for him means we're more likely to give his ideas credit, right? Same thing with Steven Spielberg, he's a director, right? And so if he says something about movies, we're more likely to pay a little attention to it than just if your friend said it. Warren Buffett, um, who's famous for being uh, a good investor in the stock market for, for being a billionaire who's made a lot of money, and most recently for quoting, being quoted as saying he, he pays less in taxes than the secretary, so it's become a big part of the economic debate right now. So if Warren Buffett says something about taxing the rich, people listen to it differently than if someone else says. Okay, interest. Sometimes you want to use this just to get people's attention. Maybe it directs the focus of a point you're trying to make. It's a good place to use it in either in an introduction, it can be used in a conclusion, it can be used to lighten up a speech, right? So if a genius says the difference between stupidity and genius is that genius has its limits, it's going to have a different effect on people reading it and it's going to grab people's attention. Okay. Controversy is when you are dealing with a topic where, you know, obviously there could be a lot of opinions about it, and there are all different kinds of ways you can use this. Um, it comes up with politics, religion. I want to look at the last example here. So, the Pakistani official said that the CIA was killing mere foot soldiers, right? Now, why might Greg Miller have put that in quotes? Yes. Because a soldier is someone who's usually like respected by the people of their country and to say that they're just merely like on foot, they're not involved in like, a serious action, it's kind of like downplaying that. So that statement alone is kind of controversial. Exactly. The fact that they're, it's almost like, well, they're expendable. They're not really people. They're not equal to these more valuable soldiers that we have, right? And so presumably, you know, he didn't want to become associated with that like people are somehow misrepresenting it or whatever. So by giving it a direct quote, he avoids any sort of controversy and makes it also clear that that is how the Pakistani official is thinking exactly, and what he based on what he said. And so it's a way for you as a as a writer to to get some controversial statements out there, put them in quotes, then you don't have to worry about them being attributed to you. Okay. Um, and then this is the final one, which, as I said, you all are familiar with, which is where you take something specific that's that's in the text you're talking about. And in this case, this is revealing something specifically about Smuts's language that she would um, give this kind of evidence as an example of human emotional expression. Hugging, kissing, begging, bowing, right? And that these are all, all seen in these primates. Any questions about this? Okay. Now, when, you, when should you paraphrase rather than quote? See a lot of people quoting things that they don't need to, and the biggest one is when the information is factual. If your source says something that's a statistic, you don't need to quote that statistic, generally speaking. You know, you can paraphrase it like this. And the other thing is that the ideas in the original aren't expressed in an especially noteworthy way, right? And so 
Samantha has said the best place to get ice cream is at Bev's. That's not an especially interesting sentence. It's just pretty much, I mean, it's opinion, but it's very straightforward. So go ahead and paraphrase it. Dropped quotes. A drop quote is when you have put the entire sentence there in quotes and there's no context for it, right? And it, it, it's a very common thing to do, and, I, and I'm going to be writing drop quotes in your margins all over the place if you do it. Or I might just write MLA3B. But basically what it says is that you should use signal phrases instead. So, uh, representative from California, Senator Harkin says, quote, right, or he claims, whatever verb is appropriate for, for that thing. There's a wonderful chart that's, on, that's in Hacker, that's on your handout, I believe. Okay, 383. There's a fuller list of verbs that are really handy to get a handle on. Just please don't use them unless you feel really confident that that's actually what you're doing. They're not obviously interchangeable. They have different connotations. Okay, so a little bit more about where you can put quotes. You don't have to have a whole sentence. You can use parts of a quote, parts of a sentence. So here's an, here's an example. Well, why don't we just start here and you read the first one? Our present century may not be quite as perilous for the human race as an ice age says. But, but he thinks we still face great challenges. Okay. Middle of sentence. What speaks of the woman writing needing money in a room of her own, which critics of Wolf have dismissed um, as in elitist. Okay, so we think it's elitist. Okay. Where George Orwell used simple language to describe a dystopia in which people simply disappeared always in the of life. Okay? We live in society. Exclusively dependent on science and technology, which is Carl's head, in which hardly anyone knows that anything that science. Okay? So you can see how quotes are being used quite differently in each of these examples. And you can also um, start looking at where the punctuation is. Okay, so we're going to look at that next. Punctuation, generally speaking, goes inside the quote. Periods and commas go inside the quote. Colons and semicolons go outside the quote. And question marks and exclamation marks go inside the quote unless they pertain to the whole sentence. So there you have to look at the meaning. So in this, in this case, you can see the question marks inside because it's a question that she's asking. Whereas in this case, the, the quote is not a question, it's a statement, right? So the question mark goes outside. Everybody with me? And these are all on in the Packer, Packer P5 section. Now let's say you have an original quote and it's just too long, there's like some stuff that you, that you don't think really helps make your point and you want to take it out. And that's fine to do. Just go ahead and put that ellipsis in there. So here, Casco is arguing that the process of change is happening all around us, right? And then I thought there were some extra words in his original that just weren't helping make my point. And so I took them out, included some more of the sentence, and then the rest of his sentence, there was some more stuff. So I could have put some more ellipses in there, but instead, I just paraphrased the very end of his sentence to still get the idea in there. But that way I could avoid having lots of breaks. So this is one way to do that. Okay. Sometimes you need to add words to the original quote. Has anybody done this before? Where you found the quote doesn't integrate into your sentence because it's ungrammatical. Well, if that happens, don't just change the quote. Indicate to the reader that you've done so and do it by using brackets. So in this case, if I said smoothies contain all the ingredients I need to get through class until 1.40, and you wanted to quote me but make it in the third person, you would take out the I, add the F, G, and then of course the verb doesn't make sense anymore, so you add an S to it. And then that way the reader can tell immediately, oh yeah, of course, originally I said I, but now it's been changed to make it grammatical for this sentence. All right, using block quotes, when you have a long section of text, meaning four lines or more, or if you have poetry that's three lines, you're going to use block quotes. 
And they're done differently. And the whole idea is you don't use question marks for these things, quotation marks. And you usually set it off with a colon. So it'll look like this. There's the statement, colon, something's coming up, it's going to be a block quote, here it is, it's indented, there are no quotation marks, and you have your source right there. Okay? This is also an app. There are a few exceptions to these rules, right? Periods and commas. As I said, generally go in the quote mark, but you'll see that this is different with MLA, which you're going to be doing a whole lot of. So when you get to something like this, it's unfortunate this wraps on the next line, but you've got the quote, then the citation, then the period. Okay, so um, the problem is once you get in the habit of doing this, you start to forget how to do it with um, something where there's no citation. Philosophy papers follow different rules, so just be aware when you're writing a philosophy paper. Throw these rules out and get different ones. Okay?